you very much, Gavin. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you just lots and lots of slides. Um, I was put forward as an expert on the, in this period, and I'm certainly not that. Um, I, probably largely because of our involvement with the National Trust for Scotland and the Ben Laws Historic Landscape Project. But the great thing about these sort of things is uh, it's uh, um, taking part, it's a participation in research frameworks like this, I think, are always the useful thing, which is why I always put myself forward for them, because I end up learning an awful lot. Um, and I, I started off knowing very little about this period. So I was quite terrified when Gavin gave me the distribution map of sites that belong to this sort of period, and he said, can you make some sense out of that? Uh, so um, it's like somebody threw up Smarties on a... Uh, on, uh, on a map, a distribution map of Perth and Kinross. Um, but maps really are, this is, this is the period, what we're looking at here is the, the, the type of evidence that we've got. What, does, what, what is this period from the Reformation until 1715 I'm doing just because that's when General Wade starts building roads roughly. Um, this sort of period is characterised really by the rise in the, uh, our understanding of the individual in the archaeological record um, and the landscape scale, scale, landscape scale nature of the evidence. So we have, uh, if you go on to the National Library of Scotland, you have a huge number of maps that will tell you about this sort of period and the Pont has already been uh, uh, discussed and mentioned and the detail in it is fantastic and it goes into, you know, there's little castles, there's mills, uh, there's bits of woodland, so historic woodland for the first time is being shown here along the side of Loch Tay. Uh, and little things like here, there's salmon, trouts, eels, perch in Loch Tay, and even a little thing that says a king drowned in Loch Tay. So nice bits of evidence. Like I have no idea which king it was. Um, he probably got pulled down by all the fish. Um, but it, all the details in there, uh, little uh, uh, islands that have uh, have houses and things on them, so sort of long-term survival of the sort of Cranog tradition, uh, but lots of settlement sites and names, and place names is something that I think is something that will be important to take from these maps. Of course, uh, there are a range of these different maps, so you can look at Blouse, which takes a lot of the information, less detail, but you get start to get the landscape uh, scale of it, the bits of woodland. Uh, being marked surviving in some of these upland areas and the contrast between the lowlands uh, and the uplands is quite uh, easy to work out. And here's Perth, I can't remember which map this is on, it might be uh, one of uh, Gordon's or something like that showing the street plan, but also showing um, the Cromwellian citadel which we'll come back to uh, in due course. <coughs> so there's a whole raft of potential in understanding from a cartographic point of view the, the range and distribution of set types. And for the first time, we start to get illustrations of these places in a lot more detail. So Slezer's view of Dunkeld, of Perth, of Schoon, you can start to look at these. And we now have images of the types of places that we're looking at. Here's the, the wonderful view um, of Perth itself with the harbour uh, and the big medieval church in the middle of the river. And all the little details in the, in the foreground of these sort of more rural settlements that we can start. Where, where, where are these surviving in, in the lowlands? And what you can also see in the foreground of many of these pictures is the first really good illustration of people, individuals, or everyday people, not the big lords and the elites that we've been dealing with most of the through archaeological. But here's some real people. Uh, and a good contrast here between the, the, the uplands and the lowlands, the highlands, uh, the Gaelic and the, the, the Scots, um, guys in plaids on the left here, uh, guys in long coats and blue bonnets on, on the right. And, and something that we need to understand definitely about um, Perth and Kinross, what is that connection between the two? How do we start to build up that information? For me, uh, one of the, uh, the key features of this part of the archaeological evidence for this period is obviously the post uh, medieval settlement remains. Uh, in the upland areas, um, this really, you know, if you go out, basically people tend to think, you see stone ruins in the landscape and think these go back right into the sort of medieval period. All oh, must be over earlier sites. How, what, what do these things look like? And people tend to think, you know, the stuff that you see from the, 
uh, late 18th into the 19th century onwards, oh, maybe there was something there earlier of that sort of ilk. How much do we really understand the nature of rural settlement? You would think, actually, we've been, as archaeologists, we've been looking at it in detail for the last 20 years. Uh, the Ben Laws project focused on it. Um, but there's still a lot more to do, and there are thousands of these sites out there. Um, and there's a good amount of information that has, has yet to be teased out of them a lot. And what you can start to do is you can start to tie down individual people to some of these settlements. Um, one of the things that we were looking at in the Ben Laws project, actually, I thought, oh, we'll do this because this, this will cover the part of the thing that the, the Ben Laws project was set up to look at. Um, and then when I looked at the, all the radiocarbon dates and all the archaeological evidence for Ben Laws, um, the results, vast majority of it dates from the late 18th century into the 19th century. It's all to do really with the improvement process or the enclosures and things along the side of Loch Tay. Um, most of the ex excavated evidence relates, relates to that, not to the earlier phases. So where, where, what, what are we looking for? Well, the good thing is it comes back to maps again. I think we've got a strength in not just in the uh, district maps or the regional maps, but we have a fantastic estate maps. So this is um, uh, Farquharson's 1769 plan or one of the sheets from North Loch Tayside. And the amazing work that the team from the Royal Commission and Ancient Historic Monuments of Scotland did as part of the Ben Laws project was to take those maps and stretch them, uh, look at them in detail. What's lovely about them is, again, you can see the, the rig, you can see the buildings, you can see the areas that were left uncultivated, bits of woodland down the side here. So a difference between uh, outfield, uh, infield below the road, uh, outfield and then the shielding grounds uh, above, so that's all there. And it, it's using this information to then target sites. Uh, and what we need to start doing is being a bit wiser about how we use this information. We've got all the technology. Somebody was talking about LIDAR earlier on. We can now start to overlay these old maps onto LIDAR plots, as well as the Ordnance Survey plots, and start to zoom right in onto where these settlement sites are located. So this is what uh, Eve Boyle and the Royal Commission did as part of the Ben Laws uh, project, um, transposing these old uh, mid-18th century maps. But is that, is that the earlier sites under there? And this is the whole, the, the, as you, the, the whole of Loch T, North Loch T's had a big chunk of it from Carowin uh, to Kiltyre. And you can then take the data, the survey data from the commission, which has been overlaid, and look at all the settlements that are marked on there that survive on the ground. And then you can look at those and say, well, where are the ones that are marked on the map that are not on later survey works, they're not on the ordnance survey map, so they're either abandoned or um, they're later. And most of the way, if they're later, they're surviving, so the commission have identified them. So you can start to see where underneath earlier, uh, later structures, earlier things are, are sticking out. And I have to say, we didn't, we didn't target many of those sites. There's more to be done, I think. And that classic thing is it's all about getting access to who owns which bits of land. The National Trust for Scotland own most of the upland ground there, rather than the stuff down by the, uh, the Loch Shore, which is where most of the earlier settlements were. So um, long uh, buyer dwellings like this one at Barnassum, which would have had a, a stone foundation uh, and probably uh, turf and uh, uh, turf walls and, and crook frame to the upper levels. Um, only this one really was excavated in any extent, and most of it turned out to be uh, 18th century. Here marked on the uh, the, the Farquharson map again. Uh, one thing we were able to do, obviously, is start to look at these things in, in phasing. Um, so you can start to see how, obviously, these structures change over time. So it's a, there's a whole range of different structures. One of our problems there is the material culture that goes with it. Is, uh, in terms of the 18th century uh, and earlier than the 18th century, the vast majority of this stuff from the Reformation onwards seems to be a ceramic. There's not a lot of material coming out of it. Um, whether that's a trade thing, whether it's um, a deposition thing, whether they were digging in the wrong places, who knows, but that needs to be tested. But what we do have is we have some understanding of some of the minor uh, elite houses as well, Finlaric Castle there, but uh, Edramucky further along the glen, uh, along Loch Tay side. And excavation at Carahuin, uh, Campbell um, House, only one wall surviving, but again, the, the evidence from some of the, the maps showed there was a T-shaped 
uh, and Laird's house there, and when excavated, uh, produced uh, the radiocarbon dates from the, the 15th through into the uh, 16th, 17th century, along with plaster uh, from the walls. So it's quite a nice uh, structure. Other uh, elite houses alongside Lors uh, itself, old Lors, uh, well accompanied with the, the church and burial ground, really quite impressive uh, location that would merit further investigation. Out in these rural landscapes, of course, we have links to the towns, to the urban side of things. Um, for the first time, uh, evidence dated as well to the late 17th into the 18th century, uh, flax retting pits uh, for producing linen, for retting and scutching, soaking, basically, before um, it was being transported uh, to Perth for sale. And we know uh, in 1640s, when Perth was sacked by various armies, that one of the big things that was stolen from here was about £1,300 worth of, of woven textile. Probably from the upland landscape, though, the thing that strikes most in the distribution map is the location of shielding sites that have been mentioned already. How far back do these things go? There are thousands of them, and what's really surprising is how few have been excavated. Um, it's amazing to think that these structures are out there and only a handful really have been excavated and dated. Uh, the Ben Laws project, uh, Edra Murky Burn, we looked at this this morning, which located a Mesolithic site underneath. Um, but excavation in the interior found um, uh, a little fire pit in the, there, and the radiocarbon date actually came back as 1453 to 1651. Uh, and many of the uh, excavated sites that we've got have got that sort of date range. That's probably partly to do with radiocarbon dating as well. But this is something that we need to test uh, how far back um, uh, the shilling evidence that we've got uh, can be pushed. And we get um, ranges of different uh, phasing through them, quite complicated structures obviously being reused over time to people taking uh, crocs up to uh, re-roof them every year possibly. Um, and again, a range of dates running through from here, the 17th century, uh, through into the 18th century. Uh, this is up uh, the Lord's Burn side of things. But again, not the most exciting material culture. One or two tiny bits of courseware pottery and these tiny stone discs, well, they're not that tiny, thought to be weights for pressing cheese, basically for what, that's the sort of thing we think they should be doing up in the shillings. So obviously that's the sort of thing that we find. Um, so we need more of this sort of evidence in these uh, transhumans landscapes. Um, Perthshire and Kinross were cr crisscrossed uh, in the 17th century by various military campaigns. We've already alluded to a few of them. This must have had a major impact on the archaeology of the area. Um, many of the houses along Loch Tayside and Glen Lyon were burnt uh, in the 1640s uh, uh, by the Montrose, basically by Campbell area. So uh, Montrose and McDonald's rampaged through there. Um, and of course, uh, the citadel, uh, uh, the Cromwellian citadel, 1640, uh, 1650s, um, built to the south to garrison uh, Perth and uh, overall the population of this area. Um, the excavation's been done there. We found uh, uh, the remains of the, uh, the, the bastions and ditch have been found. One of the big impacts of this was the demolition of about 150 houses, some uh, burial sites and the, the medieval hospital. So it had a huge impact on, on the town itself. But what of the people? Well, we know that uh, many of the people from Perthshire fought in these armies and they went off and uh, uh, Mungo Campbell of Lors was killed at the Battle of Aldern. Um, and of course, uh, many of them of the Lors Regiment and from Glen Eagles fought at the Battle of Dunbar. And they've been reading the papers over the last uh, couple of years. You'll know that recent work has, uh, has identified prisoners from the Battle of Dunbar, Scots prisoners, uh, buried in uh, Durham uh, Cathedral, uh, and they've subsequently done bits of DNA analysis on them and radiocarbon dating, all that sort of, all the usual things. But look, some of these guys probably were from Perthshire, uh, either died here uh, in uh, Durham uh, or were transported uh, abroad. And we know roughly where many of the regiments uh, came from, rough areas. What's really interesting is at the other end of it, when people are transported, uh, to the uh, to Massachusetts, 
of England. Um, we know individually what they were called and what they did there, but actually doing it the other way around, where did these people come from? Uh, were they farming in Glen Eagles? Were they up the glens uh, of Loch Tayside? Who knows? But that's something I think it'd be nice to start to push back. Battlefields are something obviously that continues. There's been a lot of work done at Killycranky recently, obviously designated sites, um, bits of old excavations, soldiers leap there. Um, the most uh, important pieces of work recently has been done in advance uh, of the proposed extension or widening of the A9 and lots of metal detecting material, lots of good material culture in this case being recovered from this site. Here we go, shorts, buckles, shoes, all that sort of stuff. Dunkel, the forgotten battle basically of uh, the first Highland Rising, uh, has an impact on the town. Uh, lots of the town was burnt, uh, lots of scars on buildings from bullet holes. Um, only one structure uh, at the far end of Cathedral Street probably survived the subsequent fire and then the rebuild. So most of the things that we see in Dunkeld are post-1689. So what about churches? There's what happens in the Reformation? What's the archaeological uh, impact? What can we get from the Reformation uh, about the, uh, the the ecclesiastical nature. There's a lot, whole uh, amount of research that could be done on that side of things. I mean, Dunkeld Cathedral is split just down to its, uh, its church uh, on its own. Um, it's already been mentioned as a great research area. And here we have the remains of Dunkeld House, uh, which burnt down in a fire, I think, in the 19th century. Um, uh, bits of geophysics have been done. Steve Driscoll did some uh, and Glasgow University, and there's been bits of excavation there as well. But what it's really showing is that one of the big areas, I think, of this sort of period that is untapped um, is some of the designed landscapes, another designation um, around many of the structures. Some of them mapped lovely here at Ming's Castle uh, out um, in Tayside Way, uh, Blair Castle again. So the great book uh, on uh, Scotland's gardens, a lot of early terraces, and very little of this stuff has been investigated archaeologically. We've got records of it from um, field survey work and from aerial photography like this, but there's a whole lot more information needs to be done. I like this one particular because John Reed, the man who writes the Scots Gardener, the first gardening book in Scotland, is from Perthshire pretty much. He works at Drummond Gardens, then at Lors, and he eventually moves to New Jersey when he becomes basically a, an urban planner. Um, and it's a fantastic publication, still good for your allotments today. So I um, just thought I'd throw this one in, big design landscape, Kinross House, uh, much change, very little work's been done archaeologically uh, around these sites. Some has been done in the, the kitchen garden here, uh, not an awful lot, but more could be done, I think, in terms of understanding how these things have changed and amazing plans of some of these design landscapes. And a great contrast between the, the, the rural upland settlements uh, and these all happening at roughly the same time. You've got these battles raging across Perthshire and then you've got people laying out landscapes like this at the same sort of time. Really just shows you the contrast between rich and poor. Tamworth Castle, need I say any more? Um, other things, there's lots of things that we could do research into this period. Pubs. Uh, let's do some research into pubs. The old ship in, seemingly 1665, and uh, there's probably earlier ones out there. Um, clans, um, we haven't really spoken about family names and things, but uh, coming back to those battle sites uh, and the, the links to some of the regiments, the Campbells, Robertsons, uh, Murrays, Drummonds, these are all Perthshire names and something, again, that archaeology has uh, has a potential to help identify and also has an impact on tourism and grabbing people back, the diaspora. Um, and of course, what's happening, because the last thing to mention here is the um, what's happening with in terms of education and things at this sort of time. This is a time where laws are being passed for setting up of parish schools and all that sort of thing. We have the famous Inner Pethry Library uh, set up in the 1680s. Um, Education, that's the first time. Let's let's go and do some excavation work around some of these sites as well, see if we can get a different type of understanding of the, the 17th century. Um, that's, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, there are so many different elements to this time period. I, I don't know really where to begin. I've looked at some of the 
uh, rural stuff because that's what I'm more familiar with. Haven't touched on the urban stuff, but there's a, there's a whole depth of material there. Um, but there's an awful lot of different things that we could we could start to, to delve into. Um, metal detecting, uh, uh, burials and graveyards, gravestones, understanding the impact of uh, the uh, Reformation, um, the Darien scheme, lots of Persia folk buy into that. Thomas Drummond, who is one of the uh, heed guys for the whole Darien scheme, is in fact one of the captains uh, from the Campbells that go uh, and uh, take part in the mass massacre of Glencoe before he goes into... So, um, anyway, I'm just going to leave it at that, just because I like that. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I'll stop there.